Hey guys, Josh Vives here, and today we will be talking about decentralized exchanges. This will be a multi-part series where we start out with the Uniswap V1 in the first video and move on to analyzing V2 and V3 in the coming videos. Without further ado, let's begin with V1. With the new landscape of decentralized finance, there must be a way to exchange between so many cryptocurrencies. But how do you achieve that? One way is through a centralized exchange where a central authority holds pools of currencies. Then the exchange will state their exchange rate, and if both parties agree to trade, then the trade will be conducted. However, this means that the control of the currencies lie in the central exchange, which isn't so great for a currency that aims to be decentralized. Since the current exchange can manipulate prices to siphon profits from consumers. The solution to this is a technology called smart contracts. Using math and code, smart contracts can incentivize people to become market makers by stashing their tokens in liquidity pools and receiving a small award for doing so. The whole using math and code part will be what we are covering in this video. To begin, let's take a look at the algorithm behind a popular decentralized exchange called Uniswap. We look at the first version, Uniswap V1, since it is the simplest and will give us something to start with. Uniswap V1 is an open source exchange which allows the trading of ETH with any ERC20 token. As a short digression, an ERC20 token is a smart contract running on the Ethereum blockchain that keeps a ledger of transactions. This ledger must follow the ERC20 token standard, which is a template for implementing various functions. The smart contract contains code that will specify how to handle transactions between parties, and users can transact the ERC20 token by executing the smart contract code. Basically, an ERC20 token is a way to create a cryptocurrency by just riding on top of the already popular Ethereum blockchain instead of having to go through the technical trouble of writing a new blockchain. I could go into the details of describing the code behind an ERC20 token another day. Anyway, Uniswap allows for the exchange of ETH with any ERC20 token, effectively allowing the exchange of two ERC20 tokens since one can just perform two swaps. It begins with liquidity pools. Say, the first liquidity provider, Alice, believes that the conversion rate of DAI and ETH should be stabilized at 1000 to 1. She will then deposit both DAI and ETH in that ratio to the liquidity pool. She could be wrong about the exchange rate, which she will suffer something called impermanent loss, but that's for another time. Now, for example, she puts in 5,000 DAI and 5 ETH into the liquidity pool. And in return, the liquidity pool will give her 5 liquidity tokens. These tokens are a way of keeping track who has contributed the most into the liquidity pool. And we will come back to it later. Let's keep Alice as the only liquidity provider for now and see what happens when somebody comes make a trade. If Zack comes along and wants to trade 5,000 DAI for ETH in this liquidity pool, he will put in 5,000 DAI and the liquidity pool will calculate how much ETH he gets by using the constant product market maker formula. This formula dictates that the product of ETH and DAI will always remain constant. Since the product is currently at 5,000 times 5 equals to 25k and we know that the future amount of DAI is going to be the original 5,000 Alice has deposited plus the 5,000 Zack will put in which equates to 10,000, then we divide 25k by 10k to get that the final amount of ETH inside should be 2.5. And hence, Zach should receive 5 minus 2.5 equals to 2.5 ETH for giving 5,000 DAI. Any other trader that comes along wanting to trade ETH and DAI will be subject to the same rule. So let's say Yvette comes along and wants to trade 1 ETH with DAI. After her deposit, the amount of ETH will be 3.5, and the amount of DAI should hence be 7,142. Hence, Yvette should receive 10,000 minus 7,142 equals to 2,858 DAI tokens. Now, the first thing we notice is that Zack had an exchange rate of 2,000 DAI per ETH, whereas Yvette had an exchange rate of 2,858 DAI per ETH. This may seem unfair, but it's actually due to the fact that Yvette traded at a time where ETH was more scarce. 
if we see the graph over here, the more scarce beef is, the greater amount of dye one will have to put in to receive the same amount of beef. The price adjustment is built into the market maker formula, and if the quantity traded is small compared to the total liquidity volume, then the price is visualized as the gradient of this graph, which is the ratio of the two quantities of beef and dye. Now, so far we have a mechanism of exchanging dye with beef, but there is still no incentive for Alice to put in her precious tokens into the liquidity pool, so we need to come up with an incentive for Alice to do so. This is done by a small 0.3% exchange fee, which will be siphoned into the liquidity tokens. A simple rearrangement of this formula will now give us a formula for calculating the tokens received for the amount of tokens put into the pool. This also means that the statement that the product stays constant is not actually entirely true, since the product actually increases slowly due to the exchange fee paid by the traders. Now let's talk about liquidity tokens. The liquidity token represents the total proportion of the liquidity pool one holds. Basically, if Alice is the first provider and she puts in 5,000 DAI and 5 ETH, then currently she will be the sole owner of the entire liquidity pool. And this will be represented by the 5 liquidity tokens that she owns out of the total number of liquidity tokens, which is also 5. However, when Bob comes along and wants to deposit his stake, then he must do so in the same ratio as the current ratio of the liquidity pool. Let's say he deposits 10,000 DAI and 10 ETH. Then he will be rewarded with 10 liquidity tokens. Now you see that the number of liquidity tokens one holds is proportional to the total share of the pool one owns. So let's say after some trades, the profits that the liquidity pool has made is 15 DAI and 6 ETH. This will be split proportionally to the liquidity providers. So when Alice wants to take back her money, the liquidity pool can then use these liquidity tokens to calculate that she will receive 33% of this profit, meaning that she takes home an extra 5 DAI and 2 ETH for her contributions. When Alice does so, it is said that Alice is burning her liquidity tokens. Note that this doesn't mean that she is destroying any money, since the liquidity tokens are just an instrument to keep track of the ownership of the pool. There are many other interesting things you can do with liquidity tokens, but that's for another video. And that's about it. We have basically covered the mechanisms of the Uniswap V1 algorithm. So let's dive right into the code. Don't worry if you haven't learned how to code yet. You'll probably still gain a better understanding by watching on. And who knows, this may even be your first introduction to coding. Firstly, a quick crash course on smart contracts. These are code that live on the Ethereum blockchain which implements various functions that perform certain tasks. Each contract has a unique address, which allows anyone to call these functions. A smart contract can do many things, like voting, fundraising, loans, ERC20 tokens, and many more. Now, because each ERC20 token is a contract, each token can be identified with a unique address as well. How can a token contract keep track of who owns how many tokens? It does so using a ledger map which is just a dictionary of how many tokens each address owns. Now these addresses can be people's public addresses, or they could be contract addresses as well. Does this mean that a contract can own or store cryptocurrency? Absolutely. You see, almost everything in Ethereum has an address, and since a ledger is just a map between addresses and numbers denoting the amount of currency that the address has, there's nothing stopping you from sending currency to a contract. Sometimes you call a function with some funds attached, which we'll encounter later, and these functions have a payable modifier. There are two Viper contracts that we'll look at for Uniswap. Viper is a blockchain programming language, but it's older and has fewer features compared to today's languages like Solidity. But rest assured, the syntax is pretty intuitive, and I'll be explaining each step along the way. The two contracts are the factory and exchange contracts. Basically, the factory contract offers a template that other developers can use to build an exchange for their own token. This template is written in the exchange contract. To explore the Ethereum blockchain, we take a look at the official Uniswap V1 website, which leads us to 
and etherscan.io address. This is the original factory contract. Pasting this into my color coded editor, we see that there is an init function that is called to initialize the template code, ideally by the creator of Uniswap. This line ensures that it is only called once, and this line makes sure that the template isn't empty. After that, anyone can call this create exchange function, which uses the template we have from the init function and creates a new exchange based on that template. The rest of the code is just bookkeeping as well as making sure that we do not have duplicate exchanges for the same token address. So now, if we go back to etherscan.io and scroll around, we can find the function called init, which contains this exchange template. Let's take a look at this exchange template in our editor and we'll go through these functions. Feel free to jump to the following timestamps if you want. The first function is the setup function, which was actually called from our factory contract. We set the self.factory variable to the sender of the message, and since the setup is called from the factory contract's create exchange function, this means that the sender of the transaction is the factory contract, which also means that message.sender is going to be the address of the factory contract. The name and the symbol are for decorative purposes, and the decimals basically inform users to put the decimal point 18 digits away when looking at how much tokens a number is representing. Secondly, the add liquidity function is what we covered in the theory part of this video. We see that there are two cases, one for the initial investor and the other one for an additional investor. The initial investor one is quite straightforward. Alice, our initial investor, would call the add liquidity function with some ETH sent with the contract. This ETH is stored in message.value. At the same time, she passes a parameter, max tokens, to indicate how much tokens she is willing to put in. The amount of ETH she sends and the max tokens she indicates will determine the exchange rate since she is the initial liquidity provider. Her wallet address must also contain that amount of tokens, otherwise the transaction will fail over here. The rest of the code just means liquidity tokens equal to the amount of ETH she sent, along with some basic checks. For the case of an additional investor, the contract must do a little math to calculate how to charge the right ratio of tokens and mint the right amount of liquidity tokens. The next investor, Bob, comes along and sends ETH to this function, calling it with the max tokens that he is willing to give and the main liquidity that he wants to receive. The contract then calculates how many tokens to withdraw from his account, throwing an error if it exceeds his indicated max tokens. It also calculates how much liquidity tokens to reward him with, reflecting at the proportion of the pool he owns. Note that the plus one here acts as a ceiling function, and although it's imperfect, it barely impacts the accuracy since one actually represents a very small amount of tokens due to the 18 decimal places. Another thing to note is the calculation of ETH reserve, which is done by subtracting the ETH sent in the transaction from the ETH stored in the exchange contract. It is like this because when sending ETH, it is actually immediately added to the balance even though the transaction has not completed. This means that to find the actual reserve before the transaction has happened, one needs to subtract away the current transaction's contribution. If the transaction fails at any point in time, then the ETH will be returned and the transaction never happened. This code just adds the liquidity tokens to Bob's account, and this withdraws tokens from his account. A cert over here basically aborts the entire transaction if the tokens were unable to be withdrawn for any particular reason. With that, we move to the remove liquidity function, which is very similar in behavior because it just calculates how much ETH and tokens to return based on the liquidity tokens that the message.sender wants to burn in proportion to the total amount of liquidity tokens. After that, the liquidity tokens are burned and the relevant transfers are made. Now we get to the interesting part, the get price function. Actually, there are two of them. One is get input price and one is get output price. The difference between the two is that one calculates the amount of tokens the trader gets out given the amount of tokens he puts in. And the other one calculates the amount of tokens the trader needs to put in in order to be given a certain amount of tokens that he wants. 
or get input price, we simply do a little rearrangement of the equation we had before and multiply by 1000 to remove the decimal places. We get the following expression, which we see in the code. For get output price, the procedure is exactly the same. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We are now done with the bulk of the exchange. The rest of the functions are simply wrappers around these functions that achieve various things such as exchanging and depositing the output into a different address, but I'll leave that for you to explore yourself. Now before we end off the video, let's just say that there are some imperfections with this Uniswap algorithm, such as impermanent loss. In the following videos, I hope to cover Uniswap v2 and v3, which is a much bigger beast altogether but I'll try to break it down like what I did for Uniswap v1 in this video. This was actually my first high effort video, so if you enjoyed it, please do leave a like and subscribe, and it will really motivate me to put out more videos like these. So yeah, thank you, and have a nice day.